For a science fair project, we did a series of tests of different materials under vacuum and under pressure. For this, we used a stainless steel pressure vessel with a capacity of 80 liters. It is rated for the range between full vacuum up to a pressure of 7.5 bar or 110 psi. That's 7.5 times the normal atmospheric pressure at sea level. And it means that when we apply this pressure, there's a force of 75 kilonewtons pushing against the lid of the vessel. That's equivalent to the weight of this stack of parts pushing from the inside out. There's no inspection windows in the pressure vessel. So in order to see what's going on inside the vessel, we'd have to place a camera into it, which would have to endure the same conditions as the test samples. We'd also need a light. So naturally, I asked my mom if she would mind if we used her iPhone to film a science fair project. She didn't. I might have forgotten to tell her exactly what we planned to do with the phone, but we made sure that we had enough savings so that we could buy her a new one, just in case. For the vacuum tests, we use these vacuum pumps. The rocking piston vacuum pumps that can create about a 96% vacuum, meaning that they can remove about 96% of the air molecules from an enclosed space. For autoclave use, we have this oiled rotary vane pump. It can get very close to a total vacuum. But this style of vacuum pump is much more delicate and doesn't like high humidity in the pumped air. As you will see, we created a lot of humidity in the pressure vessel. And since 96% was more than enough vacuum for this series of tests, we ran it with the rocking piston pumps. One of our main concerns was the phone's potential for overheating. If you lower the air density that the phone is in by 96%, it practically gets no cooling, which isn't exactly perfect if you're simultaneously running the phone's screen, camera, and light. Clearing that heats up every smartphone very fast in the best of circumstances. For the tests, the pressure vessel is laying on its side. We've mounted the phone with a simple holder made from Legos and placed the samples on a wooden board in front of it. After the lid was secured, the vacuum pumps are started. The vacuum level in the vessel can be monitored on these digital manometers. At first, the pressure drop is pretty fast, but it slows down as the pumps get closer to their limit. At some point, the pressure the vacuum level does not increase anymore, and so we kept it there for a while. Then we opened a valve to let the air back in. Pressure testing works similar to the vacuum tests. We pressurize the vessel to 7.5 bar, let it sit for a while, then release the pressure. Let's see how the iPhone and our other samples did in our tests. We sped up most parts of the video because it takes a significant time to pressurize or evacuate a vessel, and because the increased speed makes it makes the changes to the size of the samples easier to see. In real time, the test took up to 10 minutes per run. We started off with a simple test, with a balloon and a vacuum, hoping that the iPhone's life wouldn't end right there. As soon as the vacuum pumps were turned on, the drop in air pressure caused a sudden condensation of water droplets in the air. The balloon started to expand rapidly, and was soon beyond the point where we would have expected it to burst. At the bottom of the screen, you can see the balloon pushing against the needle that pins it to the board. The vacuum level had stabilized at 95% before we left the air back into the vessel. We were very surprised that the balloon hadn't burst. I'm very happy for the iPhone, because after the brief test, it still worked fine. So we moved on to the next level. For the second test, we chose to film white and blue closed-celled foam, a marshmallow, and a kitchen sponge representing the open-celled foam. The yellow square in the back is um, there to help you visualize the changes in shape and size to the samples during the test. Now, closed-celled foam is, uh, doesn't allow the air or other gas to escape from its cells, or it doesn't allow it to go away from the material, so it affects the material. Open-celled foam also has cells, but these cells are not enclosed. They are interconnected. That means that the air or liquid that is in one of these cells can move from one cell to another. A great example of this is a sponge. Once again, condensation appeared as soon as the vacuum pumps were turned on. At the same time, the marshmallow started to expand fast. This is logical because it consists of closed cell foam and the material is very elastic. That means that it does not require a lot of force to be stretched when the outside pressure drops and the gas inside the marshmallow cells try to expand in order to adapt to the lower pressure level. 
As the test continued, the pressure dropped even further. The marshmallow kept expanding until its material couldn't keep up with the expansion anymore. The cell's walls burst, and the contained air could escape. At this moment, the marshmallow material was effectively an open cell foam. But that changes again. The marshmallow consists of elastic, sticky material that makes the edges of the ripped cell stick together again when the pressure is equalized. This returns the material back to a closed cell foam, just with much less air in its cells. When the air is let back in into the evacuated pressure vessel, the atmospheric pressure compresses the marshmallow to a much more compact size than it had at the same pressure before we started the test. Let's have a look at the other samples that increased speed. The closed cell foam samples also changed size and shape, but not as significantly as the marshmallow. That is due to the stronger material of those samples. It provides more resistance to the expanding air in the cells. When the air was let back in into the vessel, the closed cell foam samples returned almost to the same shape and size as before the test. The water boiling test was really interesting. At first, the water was calm while the pressure kept on dropping. Then suddenly, it started boiling violently for a very short period of time. The boiling obviously produced enough water vapor to reduce the vacuum level enough to stop the boiling. We've tested the iPhone thoroughly now. It's been under three vacuum stages and it hasn't shown any fatigue yet. But now we're going to put it into, into a pressure test. Now pressure doesn't pose a risk in the overheating set of problems, but it does pose a risk to the air sealed components of a phone, like the camera or the battery. To pressurize the vessel, we use this compressor. It can deliver up to 14 bars. That's 14 times the normal atmospheric pressure at sea level, which is more than enough because we only plan to use 7.5 bars in the tests. As soon as the pressurized air started rushing into the vessel, the balloon started to shrink and fluttered very fast. The fluttering was caused by the entering air rushing by the balloon. As time went on, we reached 7.5 bars of pressure. The balloon was compressed to a fraction of its original volume but not less than one-seventh of the original volume as one might expect. That is because the air in the balloon is already pre-compressed when the balloon is under normal atmospheric pressure. Otherwise, balloons wouldn't burst with a bang. When we released the pressure, we saw the same phenomenon as with the vacuum tests. The pressure dropped, causing a sudden condensation of water droplets in the air. Only that this time, the pressure drop was even sharper and longer, and there was much more air and subsequently, also much more moisture in the pressure vessel. The iPhone was dripping wet when we took it out, but it was still working, so we started to become really impressed. On to the last test. As soon as the valve opened, the pressurized air rushes in. The marshmallow and the large closed cell foam objects instantly start to shrink. As the test continues, the other samples shrink suddenly, when the cell's walls can't withstand the pressure any longer without deformation. The far left sample shrinks in a waveform, as the other sample of blue foam develops an upward slope at one end. Once we started to release the air, all these samples started to go back to their original shape and size. But the two types of blue foam didn't fully recover. That's because the force of the compressed air in the foam cells is not strong enough to fully expand the cell walls back to their original shape. In order to get the other samples back to their original shape, we would have to put them into a partial vacuum. That would help the air in the cells to expand the cell walls back to their original shape. The iPhone survived all of the vacuum and pressure tests and the resulting moisture buildup. The video feed and light never cut out. That was really impressive. We certainly could have killed the phone or triggered an overheat shutdown by extending the duration of the vacuum tests. But since we're not into uselessly destroying things, we didn't do that. For the foreseeable future, not many people will be shooting extended video clips in a vacuum. Maybe spacewalks? Anyways, if you plan on doing so, we'd happily run extended tests on your phone. Thank you for joining us!